let's get into this word. You guys ready to get into this word today? Amen. Amen. If you could with me, please, let's turn to uh, Proverbs uh, 10 to Proverbs 10 to and I'm reading from the NIV. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. I'm going to say that again. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. You know, one verse so profound. When I read it the first time, the first thing that came to my mind was relevant. It's the first word that came to my mind, relevant. Ill-gotten gains. I mean, that speaks to our society today in America. Um, specifically, you know, Western civilization as a whole, we see so many examples of this verse, and I pray that you guys start to see the parallel as we get going here. Um, but before we jump too far into it, I feel like we've got to get something straight. We've got to define ill-gotten treasures before we even get started. So ill-gotten treasures, also referred to as treasures of wickedness or ill-gotten gains. Of its definition, money or things acquired by dishonesty or deceit. Again, Money or things acquired by dishonesty or deceit. Once we define it, we can really start to see examples uh, of where this is at in our society. I saw a story of uh, some CEO that had like a record bonus, like the biggest bonus of this company's, uh, you know, history. And at the same, in the same conversation, she laid off like a record amount of employees. So it's like record bonus, record amount of layoffs, just, just greed all the way through, right? We don't, what's the need for that? Um, you see it in, in Congress, you know, bribery is going all the way up to Supreme Court justice. Uh, you see it in Congress when it comes to Congress and their family members clearly partaking in insider trading, the definition of insider trading. Uh, and then surprisingly, when the, when the vote to come out to ban that activity, there's no, no votes. This is, we're not stopping that, right? And, and this is not political. This is, <laughs> that's bipartisan. That's both ways. They've, they may not agree on much, but they agree on greed, all right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we even see it in our church, right? We see it in churches across. So how many stories have you seen about, you know, a church fal falsifying tax records, hiding money, not being transparent with their congregation, you know, buying these huge, lavish private jets, you know, for personal gain, for personal use? Unfortunately, we see it in our communities. Uh, and the underprivileged community especially. Every day somebody loses their life in the name of ill-gotten gain. We see it everywhere. And where does it always end up? It always ends up in the same exact place. It doesn't have any lasting value, right? There's, no, there's nothing there that can st uh, sustain you. I like how um, the ESV says it, you know, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. It might lead to temporary satisfaction, but there's no sustainability there. It'll never be enough. You always need more of it, right? And eventually, as you continue to chase it, it'll lead to something even worse, finish line. The finish line of it is scandal, shame, incrimination, in the worst of cases, death, right? But can I be honest with you guys for a second? David, can I be honest with the church? Josh, can I be honest with the church? I really struggle with this verse. Um, when I first saw it, my first, my first thought was, yeah, it's relevant, but does this really speak to me? And I've been here at this church with a lot of you guys. Does this really speak to you, right? Uh, I, I don't know about y'all, unless you guys get some secret, you know, secret CEO situation. I, I'm not wealthy. I don't know a lot of us in here that are wealthy, right? I don't see us to have this excess, uh, excess money to have, or even if we don't have that, I don't see a lot of us turn to, you know, thievery or embezzlement or some kind of crime or some kind of thing to get those kind of things. Now, I've been here for a long time. We never really, again, praise God, I'm not trying to jinx nothing, but I haven't seen any crazy situation like that, all right? So it seems like this is one of those verses where I'm like, okay, cool, check. You know, don't do bad things. We got it. We'll continue to do that, right? But and, and also, if that is, <laughs> secretly, if that is you in this church, by the way, praise God that you're here, right? There's no better place for you to be uh, than here right now if you're involved in that kind of life, right? If you get pickpocketed, just count it all joy, all right? If somebody Ocean's Eleven's you today, it's, it's all good. It's in the name. It's in the name. But this is one of those verses that we can easily write off as, 
man, that, this has nothing to do with me. And what happens when we do that? It's another sermon. We come up here. I tell you the list of things that you can and can't do, right? You come back, you nod, I nod, and then we leave, we go about the rest of our Sunday, the rest of our week, and nothing really changes from there, right? And we just go back to our life. Our routine is normal. But the more I prayed on this verse, God kept telling me, dig deeper, right? Let's broaden our view of the, con- of the context of the text itself. There's something more here than just don't do bad things, right? So I want to share with you guys what, what God showed me when I, when I got a little bit deeper. So again, I want to broaden our view of a lot of different things, but I want to start with wealth specifically. The first place I wanted to look into was just wealth. What does the Bible say about wealth? Luckily enough, we don't really have to go much further than the Proverbs itself, because Solomon just talks about this a lot in the Proverbs. You could go through and read it from chapter 1 all the way to the end, and there's just so many examples of, uh, of wealth and how it's misused in the Proverbs, right? So let's just start right there. We're going to go through three of these verses just so we can kind of start to see a little theme here. We'll start with Proverbs 11, verse, uh, for, uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 4. All right, so wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but, somebody say but, but. righteousness delivers from death. Okay, it's kind of the same vibe, right? Let's go to Proverbs 13, 11, and, and get a feel for that. Dishonesty, uh, did not, dishonest money in, uh, dwindles away, but, somebody say but, but, whoever gathers money, little by little makes it grow. Let's do one more proverb, just so we can see if we can pick up on that theme. Proverbs 15, 6. The house of the righteous contains great treasure, but, somebody say but, but the income of the wicked brings ruin. I started to see a little trend. Are you guys starting to see a little trend here? Yeah. Picking up on a theme at least, right? Mm-hmm. We may not be at our destination, but at least I'm starting to see where we're going. It looks like Solomon's always doing this thing. It's called an antithetical parallel, where he compares one thing and contrasts it with another, a clear opposite. He's above a butt right in the middle of the verse, and compares one thing with the opposite, right? And it looks like what he's doing in this case is always comparing the fruit of wickedness to the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of wickedness to the fruit of, of, of righteousness. Basically, he's always comparing the fruit, the end result of chasing after both. Right? Again, we're not there yet, but let's go a little bit deeper. Um, I don't know a lot. Um, I'm working through this stuff myself, but the one thing I always know Whenever I want to broaden my view of something, I always want to go to what Jesus says about it. Because Jesus is the great broadener of perspectives. He's always taking something that we think that we know and telling us what it actually is, right? So let's go straight to to what Jesus has to say about wealth, all right? So we're going to start with Mark 4, verses 18 and 19. And again, it'll be on the screen as well. If you want to turn to it, go ahead. But... Mark 4, verses 18 through 19. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but, somebody say but, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So Jesus is adding some extra layers on here. He's giving us a little bit more context, right? Let's try one more and see what Jesus has to say and see if we can pick up on his theme. Let's go to Matthew 6, verses 19 and 21. Again, that's Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But, somebody say but. Store up yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I really hope that we're starting to pick up on on Jesus' theme. Solomon's talking about the fruit of chasing money, possessions, and wealth. But what Jesus is doing is he's getting to the root, right? Solomon's talking about the end result but Jesus is trying to get to the cause. 
Where, where did this start? How did we get here, right? And when I saw that, that just, it just bro- the floodgates just opened for me. It just broke for me. I started to see things in this verse a little bit different. Again, Solomon's telling us ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value. Uh, in that text, he, we see the fruits of coveting wealth, right? Which is blatantly obvious today. We already talked about the examples of how people do it. We, we, we can go over that. We see what it leads to. Je- uh, Jesus is telling us, though, that the problem starts when we coveted our desires in the first place, right? Let's spend a, a, moment on, a moment on just desires in general, desires for a second, because I feel like when we, we start talking about desires, people can get a little weird about it. Um, it can go a lot of different directions when we start talking about desires, right? It, it just, everybody has a different definition of it. And what's crazy is a lot of those definitions are right. Everybody's definition kind of, it means what it means to them, right? Yeah. So I'm not knocking the definition of desires if you have a different one than this, but um, I want to get to no matter what your definition is, what is consistent about a desire, right? No matter what your definition is, desires come from either one of two places. It comes from a want, right? Like a, a want for a house, wealth, cars, new clothes, whatever it may be, a want or a need. We need air. We need, you know, we need sometimes money if you're in a bad situation. We need, we have needs as well. We, have, we need food, we need sleep. So a desire, no matter what your definition of it, stems from a want or a need, okay? But it also goes even further than that. It assumes that you don't have that of what you desire, right? It assumes that you haven't obtained it yet, right? So when we think about that, let's go even further into what a desire even means. It means that essentially you have a desire and it's not self, you're not, you're not self-sustaining. Also, you're also not self-satisfying. You can't just create that, you can't fix that desire yourself. You can't just get rid of it yourself. You can't sustain the things that you want or the things that you need. You can't just self-satisfy yourself with that, right? it means that we have to go out and search for provision for our wants and our needs. We have to get that self-satisfaction, that sustainability from somewhere, all right? And this part is, if, if you don't leave with anything, just remember this part right here because this is super profound. God gave us desires. He gave us the ability to feel, to have wants, to have needs, right? Sometimes we think about desires and we can get them. We can, that's where I mean it can get twisted. We can start thinking that, you know, this came from somewhere else. God gave us desires. If not, he would have just fixed. I'm pretty sure the way we'd be acting, it would have been easier for him to just fix us to love him and obey him conditionally and not cause no issues. But that's just not how it works, right? He gave us desires and wants and, and the ability to have wants and needs. But why did he do that? Why did he do that? Our desires, and this is super important, our desires precede our worship, right? Our desires lead us to our worship. When our needs and our wants aren't met, we are, when our needs and our wants are met, we go to the source and we worship the source that our needs and wants are met by, right? And then what happens after we get what we need from that source? We start to build trust, right? We have trust in that source. We come back to that source again and again because we expect to be fulfilled again by that source the next time. We think that that is the source that's going to fulfill whatever our wants and needs are. Simple enough, it's almost like a math equation, right? The way I like to think about it is like a cycle. It goes, desirement, uh, desire, fulfillment, worship, repeat. Desire, fulfillment, worship, repeat. Okay? Now, again, why did God give us these desires? 
He did it to show us that he's our provider. This is how he explains to us where his provision comes from, right? We have a need, we have a want, he fulfills it. And then we start, we should be worshiping that source, which is God, the one who is the provider, right? right? But is that always how it works? That's not, I don't know, I, I'll speak for myself, that's not how it works for me all the time. It's not. At some point along the line, we break that cycle, right? What do I mean by we break that cycle? We break that cycle when we substitute the source of our fulfillment with anything other than God, right? The source of our fulfillment, where we, where we become sustained from, where we're self-satisfied from, any time that we substitute God as the source of our fulfillment with anything other than God, then we have broken that cycle of what our desires should lead us to, right? When we do that, sin comes in and takes something that God meant to be beautiful, something that, meant to, that he meant to be great, something he meant to sustain you, to fill you, and it perverses it to something that it's not, right? And then it starts to, we start to trust that. We start to believe in that trust that I can start to fulfill myself outside of God. I don't need God to fill my needs. I am my provider. I can provide for myself, right? Or that relationship can provide for me, right? And that right there is the root of coveting. That is what coveting is in a nutshell, right? It's coveting one of your desires so much so that you need to lose your uh, contentment with God to fulfill it. You lose your contentment with God to go and fill that desire somewhere else. And at that point, you covet it. You wanted it so much, you stepped out of God's provision for you to get it, right? Now, like I said before, this is a relevant word, but I don't know if it's relatable. But when I think about it like that, that's relatable, right? That's not about that. This is a template, right? This verse is a template for what happens when we chase one of those desires. And we start to believe that it's what sustains us and fulfills us, right? But take out wealth and submit and just enter in anything that you want, any, any, any desire that you want in there. We can fill that out even something that we think is good, right? Something that naturally the world tells us is good. It's good to be a father and a provider, right? It's good to love your wife. It's good to work hard, to be a hard worker, right? You may not be breaking laws or anything like that. Like, hey, I'm not breaking laws. I'm providing for my family. I'm doing what I got to do. You know what I mean? I got to get what I need to make sure that they get what they need right? We can substitute that out with anything, good or bad, and we break that cycle. We turn our desires into idols. Our covetousness leads us to turn those desires into idols. And just like that, covetousness turns into the origin point for a multitude of sins. It's the starting point Wherever you want to go from there, sin-wise, you got to go through covetousness first, right? When we look at that, we go back and, and, and visit these situations, these, these CEOs taking big checks, being in the hood, stealing, robbing. Whatever the ill-gotten gain is, I understand it. I understand how you can get to a point that when you feel like God's not providing for you, that you just have to go get it. You have to. I understand it. I'm not so different. It's, 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 it's easy, especially nowadays, to look at the wealthy and to look at people who have something that you don't like. They're awful. <laughs> They're the ones who are ruining this country, right? 
But Jesus is telling us the problem is in your heart. The problem is in all of our hearts. The problem is, and that can be for money, it can be for anything. And again, I want to say that again because it's so important. Before you commit any sin, you have to covet first. Before you commit adultery, you coveted that girl at your office, right? Before you lied on the job application to get that job, you coveted that job. Before you made work an idol, you covered your, coveted your role as a provider. And where does it end up? It all ends up in the same place. There's no profit. Whatever gains that you get from that are temporary. We end up unfulfilled, unsatisfied, empty, because we trusted in something that was never meant to provide for us anyway. We had a false provider. And it leads us to some bad places. I had this analogy I was thinking about. My mom's here today. I gotta call her out. My mom's the best maker of fire I've ever seen. I don't know, it must be that Native American stuff. It just, I, don't know what, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I've seen her make a fire with two sticks. It ain't, that's not even wood. <laughs> some twigs. She told me, oh, she talked to the fire. Said, it's, you hear it? You hear that? You hear that? It's, not it's not ready yet. <laughs> she, knows. she knows. She knows how to keep it going. She knows, oh, you see that? You see that? You see that? You see that popped? That's juniper. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh what, what, is, what is that? It's that native stuff, man. Y'all got to be around it. It's crazy. But we make our own fires, though, right? And we try to sustain that fire with things that aren't God. And it goes out every time. Every time. It's not sustainable. And the only way that you can sustain it is to continue to put into it. Continue to put into it. Continue to throw into it, right? I need more money. I need to get deeper into this relationship. Right? I need, I, I need more. I need, I, I need more cars. I need a bigger house. This house ain't big enough. Whatever it is, we continue to fill this fire that's meant to sustain us with the wrong thing and it goes out. And then we are now unsustainable. You can't do nothing with the... Ma, can you do anything with the unlit fire? You can't do nothing with the unlit fire. You can't cook on the unlit fire. You can't make no s'mores on it. You can't create with it, mold with it. You can't do anything with that. It's useless. And I hope that's not what you're provi- That's what you're looking to as your provider, because if that's, if that's your means for provision, and you can't cook, you can't do anything without a fire. What, what does that end up to? Death. You can't survive like that. You can't survive like that. Right? Again, we break that cycle when we substitute the source of our fulfillment with anything that's not God. And our spiritual fire goes out. But what can save us from that, right? Just because you've gotten to that place doesn't mean that you have to stay there, right? I've been to that place multiple times. You want to talk about ups and downs? <laughs> I've been to that place. I know you guys, I know that you've been to that place. I know that we've relied on things that aren't meant to sustain us before. But what can bring us back? What can fix that cycle, right? Right? Let's go to the second half of that verse then. Let's go to, we've been talking about the first half of the verse this whole time. Let's talk about the second half of that verse. And, and we can focus on really the good news about what Solomon is trying to tell us. Again, Proverbs 10 2. But righteousness delivers from death. Simple, straight to the point. But righteousness delivers from death. Let's spend some time on just righteousness for a minute. If you look in the dictionary, go look up righteousness. It leads you to morality or, 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 or means to be morally right or justifiable or virtuous, right? 
being just, being right. So in theory, if we're in that spot, all we need to do, do is be moral, right? All we, need to be, all we need to do at face value, right, it says, but righteousness delivers from death. We should just start doing good things. The more good things that we do, it'll break this, it'll fix the cycle, right? It'll, it'll put it right where it needs to be at. We can be right back in God's provision again, getting what we need again, right? Being fulfilled again. Is that what the verse, I don't, I don't know, I got to look into it a little bit deeper. Let's look into it a little bit deeper. To just, just to test that theory of high integrity things, of just checking boxes, um, doing good things, seeing if that fixes that cycle. Isaiah 33, 15 through 17. Those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears against plots of murder and shut their eyes against contemplating evil, they are the ones who dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain of fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. I mean, sound, that's, that's profound. It's great. Sounds like I got to do... Walk in righteously, walk righteously, speak right. Just reject bad. I gotta reject bad things too. Hmm. So, I mean, it sounds good to me. I can just do more good things, and it'll break that cycle. I'll start to get what I need. Of course, I'm speaking tongue in cheek here. Um, but I do that because is this is this not us? Is that not us? Is that not the trap that we can fall into? We fall out of God's provision. We turn righteousness into a checklist, right? We turn righteousness into a list of things that we should be doing, and ultimately it'll, we'll, we'll be right back to where we need to be at. That's the source, right? Is the righteousness, our good, our good works is the source of why God provides for us. That's not what God says. God never said that. He says the opposite of that, Right? I love how Paul states this. This is in Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, sometimes you've got to broaden your view of a text. It's not wrong. Isaiah is not wrong. But sometimes we just have to broaden our view of what it's actually saying, what it means, right? Because Paul just cracked the code right there. Code unlocked, right? That's righteousness. That is the definition of of righteousness in God's eyes. Our faith in Christ. And what does that faith in Christ do? You see it here. It fixes the cycle that we broke. Our faith in Christ fixes the cycle. Our faith in Christ produces everything that we need, that we need to tame our desires. It fixes the root, right? When we focus on Christ, it starts to put our desires in the right place. We'll start to desire what he wants for us, even if that's no. Even if it means not right now. Why did God give us the commandments to begin with? To, to protect us. 
We always look at it as things that we can't do. God's saying, you can do anything. I don't need you to do these things because that hurts you. That leads you to think that I'm not your provider and that you can be sustained somewhere else that's not me. So that's why I can't let you do that. And our faith in Christ is what brings us to the righteousness that we need to be right with God. Right? If we have a want or a need, we should bring it to God first. And be okay sitting in silence for a while. You know, he's not, he don't answer us immediately. He don't, I, I, trust me, I, I wish I could send Jesus a text. I feel like he'll leave me on red sometimes, you know. <laughs> I'm like, Dan, you read it? Oh, man. All right, I'm going to wait on it then if you say so. But we need to bring our desires to Christ. He's our provider. He knows what we need. He knows what we need. When we put our trust in our desires, it makes us feel like we know what we need, or our desires and our wants are the indicator of what we need. And that's just a lie. It's not true. We can even go back to Romans 5, one, uh, uh, verses 1 through 5. You know, that ability to, to worship. Worship the right source in all circumstances, right? In all situations, in all scenarios. Worship the right source. Whether our wants and needs are met or not. That non-circumstantial worship is what leads us to endurance, the ability to wait for God's provision. It leads us to understand that God knows our desires, that he wants what's best for us. I don't have to want so bad that I go looking for other sources. I know where my source is at. I know where it's coming from, right? I'll go over a little story time. Um, because I want you guys to understand that I'm not, I'm not telling you this haven't figured it out yet. We are all in the same boat trying to figure this out together, right? Josh, can I be honest? Yeah. Brittany, can I be honest? Alma, can I be honest? I didn't want to do this. I didn't even want to be here today. Let me tell you how I got here, though. Uh, for those of you who know me, I've been, I've been in finance for a long time. Um, I work for a bank. I work for a bank. I see greed all the time. I see it all the time right in front of me. Uh, I'm transitioning right now. I've been a banker for years, um, but I'm broadening my view. And I'm currently in the process of being licensed to be a fully registered investment advisor. It's awesome. It's great. If everything goes as planned, it'll change my family's life. I was preparing for an exam. It's very difficult. One of the hardest exams. Um, it may be easy for some of y'all, but hey, it, it was hard for me. Uh, the Series 7. And um, in preparation for it, I just, I got asked to be here today. And I got anxiety. I didn't even respond. I didn't even say no, I just didn't even respond. I said, you know what, let me wait on it. Let me figure it out. Uh, give me some time. And I'll, you know, we'll see if we can, I'll see if, uh, I'll see. Let me, if, if one plus one is two, if the sun come out on Thursday, I, we'll just, we'll see. Hold, just hold, hold on, all right? But I went and took the exam. And the whole time, I was just sweating bullets. Took the exam all the way down to the last, it was like a buzzer beater, Kobe Bryant buzzer beater. <laughs> Had all the time was gone. Submitted it, and then when you submit it to, and when you submit something like that, it spins for a while. It was, it was, I, it, I felt like for, I felt like an eternity. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, I might as well just go ahead and get started on trying to retake this. Let me go ahead and get ready to retake this. This is, I already know I failed. And then the pressure comes in. The lies started coming in. Cause it's, it's, it's high stakes. If I don't get my license, I don't have a job. 
It's high stakes, a lot of pressure. And I just stopped and I said, you know, God, whatever happens, it's in your will. And then the screen populated this that I passed. Praise God. Thank you. Appreciate it. And immediately, God showed me that, you know, I'm your provider. I provide for you. And then from there, I I even waited on it further. Because sometimes you you don't react to the first thing. Sometimes you need two signs. I don't know, you need one sign to... Sometimes I need three signs. I said, I need another sign to verify the first sign. I waited on a little bit, and I got asked to do it again. Hey, can you do this on this date? And I got anxiety again. I looked at the text, and I got up, and God immediately stopped me in my tracks. And he told me, do you worship the place that I put you? over the one who put you there, over the provider? Do you worship what comes with this? Or do you worship that I gave it to you? Do you not trust me? Have I ever not been there for you? I said, all right, I'll do it. (laughs) I'll do it. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I still got another exam coming up. One more. The, this one seems like this one seems like the final boss. This one seems like the you know, the final boss in the game. This one, this one ain't no. I thought it got easier. No, this one gets harder. And I told God, I said, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I know that you're calling me to do something. And if I don't act on it, I'm gonna have to face the reality that I might be worshiping everything that comes from what you provide for me. But I'm not, I'm not willing to trust you. I'm not willing to worship you, the provider. Mm. Go back to the fire scenario, right? You see, when you have a fire that's lit by Christ, by your faith in Christ, you don't even have to worry about the wood. You don't have to do anything. You don't got... There's nothing that you can do. You can do anything. It just lights on its own. It's sustainable. And what is God asking you in return? Just to, just to believe that it's going to burn and trust that it's going to burn and trust that it can provide for you and trust that it's here. It's right here. Just turn to me. Keep your eyes on me. Focus on me. That's righteousness, right? We can't talk, we can talk about all the, I got to wake up at six, I got to get my, in my word, I got to do this, I got to do that. That's fine, and that's all good habits. But at the root of it, are we spending time with God to, for him to show us that he's been there for you the whole time? That he is your provider, that he will sustain you, that he will keep you. Are we spending time with him in that way? That's a meaningful way. I want to close with this. Um, uh, <clears throat> I never want to leave off of a, a sermon and, and not ask you guys to do something, but I want to close with the call to action. I want to call you guys to pray a dangerous prayer. I'm, I'm afraid of dangerous prayers because sometimes you get an answer. But I want to call you to pray a dangerous prayer. Ask God to examine your desires. God, examine my desires. Examine my wants, my needs. Examine them. And anything that I'm seeking to glorify anything other than you, to glorify myself, to do anything, call it out. Call it out. Fix the cycle of worship. Fix your cycle of worship. Does 
your desires lead you to, to worship God? That's what I just want you guys to ask yourself. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you. And thanks for being part of our online service today.